All right, welcome everyone. Um, great to have you here. Happy Thursday, happy holidays, all the things. Really good to see um, such a great group of people on the call today. My name is Meg Jamison and I'm the Executive Director of the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network or SSDN. I'm joined today by a ton of way more educated people than I am uh, to talk to you all about transportation electrification resources um, and specifically um, IRA and electric pay. So we'll have lots of good robust discussion today. Um, really, really pleased to have this opportunity to come together again with SAFE, our partners on this effort, um, and to continue our, our uh, Electrify the South collaborative. Um, one of the things that we were hoping to do with this initiative is to bring together um, a group of local government stakeholders throughout the course of the year to talk about the benefits um, and, and available funding to you through the, both the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So this call, this webinar, builds off of an event that we had to kick this effort off. Um, the collaborative met in Savannah back in September, and we had a really awesome group of people come together, um, city uh, sustainability staff, we had some fleet managers, we had um, planners, we even had elect elected officials and finance staff come together. Um, and really talk about um, the process of accessing federal funding for transportation electrification goals, how to engage the community, um, and basically how to work together to leverage this moment for our region. Um, so really, really pleased to have the opportunity to, to work on this with space. We hope that this is uh, gonna be a great follow-up to the discussions we had in Savannah. So if you, if you weren't there in Savannah, don't worry, we're gonna go back uh, and recap some of that talk about some resources that we have available to y'all. Um, and then we have some great guest speakers who I'll let Dory and Stan introduce here in a second. So um, really just can't say thanks enough and really happy to, to have the opportunity to, to share this information with y'all today. And from there, I'll let Dory Larson from SAFE take it away and cover our resources. Um, our agenda is, is for the day is here in front of you and uh, Dory will go through some of the resource review. All right, thanks everybody. Well, thank you, Meg, for kicking us off. So I just wanted to do a resource review of some of the things that we have available for you guys to check out and um, continue to use. So I'm going to uh, actually go live, oops, on the website so you can kind of see what the different resources are. So this is the, um, the collaborative page on the Electrify the South website. And the first page just kind of talks through like what Meg mentioned, what the intent of the collaborative is. And then we also have a list of the local participating governments so that you guys can see who all is at the table. Um, we also have a contact list that was circulated after the event in Savannah. And we would like to add folks that are new to today's call to that so, um, so that you can directly connect with any of the folks that you see um, on the website. So if you are, we will assume that folks are okay being added to the, the list and that will be shared after today's um, call. If you don't want to be added uh, for any reason, then please just reach out to me via email and let me know that. Otherwise, we'll assume um, it's safe to put you on the website and then also um, add you to the contact list so that um, folks, so you can reach out to other folks and folks can reach out to you. Um, in addition to the main page, we have an events page where um, after today's webinar, we will, um, we will host the recording on this page. We also have all of the recordings from the Savannah event. So you can see um, what's there. We also capture some of the data points that you guys could go back and review that if you're interested in it. And then we also have some blogs um, that kind of captured what happened at the event. So if colleagues are interested in learning more, um, that's a great way to, to help them understand the collaborative a little bit more deeply. And then we have a resources page that has the slides from Savannah. We'll add today's slides to the website. And then it has the um, resources that we shared with you previously. So the um, spreadsheet, that's the electric transportation um, funding streams for local governments. It has the toolkit that the um, our friends from the joint office are going to talk about more today. Included is the funding table. And then there's also the Rural uh, Mobility Toolkit linked and Raleigh's um, 
station suitability analysis um, that can be customized to your um, community to help um, visualize where suitable EV charging stations um, are. We also have some SSDN resources. So there's the Sustainable um, Recovery Center link and the link for the local infrastructure hub. I did want to just share. So if you click on the, um, the link to the Sustainable Recovery Center, uh, Michael's got this great tool here, which is the federal funding spreadsheet. If you click on it, it shows kind of an overview on one of the tabs of estimated um, timeline of when some of the funding is going to come out. So this is not specific to electric transportation, but I wanted to make sure that you guys were all aware of this resource because um, while you know we can't be certain exactly when things are gonna open in the future, so obviously there's that caveat, um, but it's really helpful to be able to visualize some of the upcoming funding opportunities. So that is again in the Sustainable Recovery Center. And then the local infrastructure hub, which is another resource, uh, helps with um, grant applications. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of those resources that are on that page. And now I would like to um, kick it over to our, uh, our friends, Stephen Costa and Julie Peacock with the Joint Office of Transportation and Energy. And I will hand it over to Stan. All right. Can you see me? Excellent, Stephen. Yeah, we can. We can see it. That looks good. And uh, and yeah, just thank you, um, Stephen Costa is representing the U.S. DOT and Julie Peacock, the U.S. Joint Office. And so they're going to go ahead and run through um, their presentation uh, that they have for us today for about the next twenty minutes, and then we'll have time for Q and A. So go ahead and track any questions you have. And when we open it up for Q&A, um, you can just raise a hand if you have a question and then we can unmute you so you can ask the question and we can enter into, into a discussion. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, for, for now, Stephen, go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you, Stan. Thank you, Dory um, and Meg. Uh, my name is, again, my name is Stephen Costa. I'm with uh, DOT's Volpe. National Transportation Systems Center um, up uh, up in Massachusetts and uh, here today representing the Joint Office with my colleague Julie Peacock. And so we're happy to just uh, provide a quick update um, from the Joint Office on uh, activities, um, some funding resources and, uh, and, and resources, technical assistance resource for communities that uh, are currently being developed. So some exciting updates to share. Uh, next slide, Lori. Okay, great. So um, this is, uh, you know, I, I know we had, uh, as Dory said, we we were glad to be there with uh, many of you all in Savannah back in September and provided an update on, on a lot of the programs that the Joint Office is helping um, administer alongside Federal Highway and some other federal agencies. So won't go into too much detail, but just as, as just kind of a quick overview, um, you know, these are the, these are the, the main programs that the Joint Office is Providing support. Um, these are these are several of the big ones that uh, are focused on electric uh, electrification uh, under Bill. So of course, there's the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program administered by FHWA, and the Joint Office is providing a lot of support to the states. Um, there's been a lot of progress uh, so far over the course of the year. Four states are close to doing uh, ribbon cuttings for new fast charging uh, stations along corridors. Eleven states. Uh, have awarded contracts. There's 16 other states with solicitations out, um, including uh, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. Um, you know, one important thing to note too, uh, although this program it's formula and it's focused on corridor uh, charging. You know, once these states reach, uh, they fully built out their corridors um, that have been designated within their states. They'll be moving over to community charging infrastructure and and you know funding. Um, and, and in, in some cases may open up uh, funds to municipalities um, within the states with the remaining um, uh, formula funds. So that's exciting. And there's a lot of states moving out pretty quickly uh, at this point. I expect a lot more to happen over the next year. Another piece of this program is the electric vehicle charger reliability and accessibility accelerator, uh, accelerator or EV uh, CRA, um, I guess is the acronym. Uh, that's it. That is a discretionary program. It's a subset 
of Nevi. Um, it was a set aside. And uh, so that opportunity closed. This is a program to basically repair broken chargers. So there was $100 million available uh, this first round. There's likely going to be uh, announcements by the end of the year on where those awards were and probably another round next year. So if there's uh, broken chargers in your jurisdiction, um, uh, you know, states and in, in, uh, localities are welcome to put in for that opportunity. Uh, the next one is the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Discretionary Grant Program also uh, run by Federal Highway. Uh, this is, uh, I'll spend more time talking about this uh, in, in a couple slides. The first round uh, remains under review. We were really hoping that we could talk about announcements by the time of this webinar, but uh, you know, this is a first year program. There's been, you know, it, it's been a big lift uh, for Federal Highway to stand this program up. Uh, it was an overwhelming response and uh, they're still making final selections. So the hope is to have those announcements by the end of the year, um, and then uh, a next, a second round announced uh, within the first quarter of, of, of 24. So we'll talk a little bit about more of that in a slide or two. Uh, the low no emissions grants program uh, run by FTA, the Joint Office provides support to that. There is an OFO um, that's open, that's expected to come uh, and open up sometime in the winter uh, of 24. So that's forthcoming. There's also the clean school bus program uh, the EPA runs that, that the Joint Office provides technical support for, and there's a current rebate program that closes on January 31st of, of, of after the new year, in the new year. So, I, you know, I just mentioned, uh, as, as Dory was just going over, there's many other federal programs that fund EV infrastructure, even if just an ancillary part, you know, DOT has its raised grants, which focuses on, um, you know, all kinds of uh, roadway uh, in downtown uh, revitalization projects, uh, smart, uh, complete streets projects and whatnot, where, you know, EV charging can be a part of that, that, you know, so that, that there's those kind of opportunities. There's, uh, the carbon reduction program, uh, funds that, that, that states are getting that are, uh, being administered, I think more or less like CMAC funding where EV, uh, charging can be a part of that. You know, the joint office is working to track all of these as is, um, SACE and SSDN, uh, but these are just the ones that the Joint Office focuses on. So just wanted to cover that. Okay, next slide. Um, so as far as uh, just going to spend a couple slides focused on the CFI grant program, I know there's a lot of interest there. So just to recap, I won't spend much time. I think most everyone is probably familiar with what the program is. This is to fund uh, the acquisition and installation of public EV charging or alt fuel infrastructure. And that's uh, EV charging. And then these other legacy uh, alt fuels are also eligible. I'd say, uh, I would say with round one, the overwhelming uh, response uh, was for EV charging. So, um, but nonetheless, there is, uh, there are these other fuels that are, that are eligible. Um, some of the other related costs that are, can be funded under CFI are listed here as well. You know, planning costs, uh, pre-construction costs can be eligible, operation and maintenance of the, uh, of the infrastructure for the first five years. There's an educational community engagement and outreach um, element that can be funded under the community program, uh, signage. And then the next slide talks, uh, just kind of shows the two different uh, uh, avenues of funding under this program. There's a community grant program. Uh, so this is for infrastructure in and around communities, not necessarily fast charging, could be fast charging, can be level two charging, um, but doesn't necessarily need to be along a designated highway corridor. In uh, this first round, there was $350 million available. And then the, 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 the range that was solicited ran from 500K up to 15 million uh, this first round. The next slide um, just highlights the quarter grant program side. And so this is specifically for fast charging or other alt fuels along, um, along highway corridors that have been designated by Federal Highway. And the funding uh, for this pot was the same. Uh, the minimum is higher. And then there was no maximum in this first round. I'm not sure if that will change. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then the eligible entities uh, is the next slide that just kind of goes over who's eligible. And essentially it's public, it's public entities, no private entities uh, under CFI. Um, but I would say, you know, as far as who applied for round one, I know Federal Highway was received just, just an impressive number of submissions from a real diverse range of applicants, uh, geographies all over the country. Um, large and small applicants and, and a whole host of different project approaches. So um, 
The next slide uh, touches on what everyone's probably most interested in is when is the next round coming out. So at this time, uh, as I had mentioned, Federal Highway is still really focused on, on making those final selections. It was a big lift standing up this program. It was very new to Federal Highway. Uh, the, the, the office that um, you know, has been leading it has been working really hard to, to try and get um, those awards uh, uh, kind of sorted through. There's been um, a lot of lessons learned, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, going through this first year. Uh, but for the next round, um, there is a tentative target date as soon as these awards are announced, hopefully by the end of the year, um, sometime by in March or by the end of March, that'd be the second round. Hopefully will, will be um, announced and the funding is estimated to be about 500 million. And then as far as what the changes might be from the first round, like I said, you know, Federal Highways learned a lot. Um, I know the joint offices learned a lot as far as, you know, kind of what uh, what went well, what could be improved for next time, um, you know, what uh, what type of information could be asked differently from applicants. I know like one thing that has held things up is leadership was very interested in knowing about the number of ports uh, per project and the number of, you know, more specific uh, information about the, the, sp the specific charging ports, number, number of charges, things that weren't necessarily asked for in the NOFO. So I think that Federal Highway is going to be um, trying to, you know, make some improvements and, and uh, change what's being asked of applicants to essentially speed up the review process um, on their end and make it easier for reviewers. Uh, you know, the joint office last time we met, uh, we, we heard, Julie and I heard a whole host of uh, feedback from you all about things um, things that, that you all would like to see in, in a revised um, process, you know, what went well and what, what was very difficult. Uh, some of the areas of feedback that we heard were the timing in the window, trying to make sure that uh, applicants have more time, improving the clarity of the NOFO uh, criteria, uh, being clearer on what the project eligibilities are, cost share eligibilities, um, application requirements, uh, being more specific on the format of the applications, making it easier for smaller applicants to access this opportunity, um, having more comprehensive uh, FAQs out and on the street uh, alongside with the NOFA when it comes out, um, a quicker response to inbox questions as they come in and more TA for prospective applicants. And on that last point, Julie's going to share some uh, exciting information about what the joint office is trying to, do, to, to develop to assist that technical assistance. Um, the next slide just very quickly uh, talks about the technical assistance strategies that the joint office has developed. Um, thus far, a lot of this has been centered on uh, states and that NEVI funding and, and uh, transit and school uh, stakeholders, but there is there is a push now to try and develop this technical assistance strategy focused on communities. And so um, Julie will talk a bit about that. The next slide um, just kind of highlights some of the TA resources that were developed in the past year. This is, for example, these are some help sheets that were put together on how applicants um, and, or how those that are developing projects can um, do better community engagement, uh, you know, kind of some nuts and bolts site selection, charging site selection checklists uh, and planning uh, strategies in, in how to develop uh, EV charging community readiness. Uh, the next slide just highlights a couple of toolkits that were put together. Um, these were put together, uh, again, kind of alongside as NEVI and CFI and these, these big programs are being stood up. Um, these two toolkits were led by DOT and then the joint office as well. Uh, you know, a real interagency effort to kind of pull together all of the various disparate resources across federal government um, that can help uh, entities plan, uh, fund, and, and maintain uh, EV charging infrastructure. So, um, you know, these were really intended to be kind of a, a broad umbrella resource. Uh, there is some good technical nuance to, to, to some of them, uh, particularly on the planning side, but uh, they're also very accessible to, you know, folks that are new to EV charging um, it, it, within the on, on the local government side and in the community side and just getting just getting involved. Um, the funding matrix that was mentioned by Dory earlier, that was a central part of these. And um, so this was kind of the first the first push on on providing some sort of resource. But uh, I'm going to just pass it over to Julie now. Um, if we go to the next slide. And she can talk a little bit more about some of the TA resources that are in development at the joint office to try and help um, to, to help communities and to help Federal Highway, uh, you know, increase the effectiveness of these programs. So, uh, Julia, I'll pass it on to you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Um, 
So I'll just go over this briefly because as Stephen said, it's still in development. So so not not everything um, is perfectly ironed out yet. Um, uh, what's on this slide is is pretty well uh, ironed out, however. So um, um, in, in 2024, we anticipate um, continuing to host um, the uh, joint office webinars uh, that supplement FHWA's webinars. And um, we're thinking on topics uh, related to um, uh, environmental justice, equity analysis, safety analysis, floodplain analysis, and workforce, and probably community engagement as well. Um, uh, uh, to help communities and they're thinking about developing CFI um, applications for this next round. And then um, the second thing builds off of the funding matrix uh, that we've heard about quite a bit. Um, and that's creating a, a, a dynamic online matrix. And, and Dory, if you go to the next slide, um, we have just like a, a screenshot here. Um, that walks through uh, various funding opportunities um, for for EVs um, by federal agency. Um, this this will be online and in, um, in 2024, um, and it'll be interactive. Um, so it'll include grant, loan, and finance opportunities from um, the Department of Transportation, Department of Energy. The Environmental Protection Agency, at U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Small Business Administration, Department of Labor, Department of Commerce, the IRS, and, and those are the big ones. And then, of course, other small agencies. Um, and it'll also include uh, general guidance on um, uh, federal funding application process and requirements, uh, as well as tips and best practices for developing project applications. So this is pretty exciting. I, um, what Dory showed earlier was also really exciting, that Gantt chart. Geez, that's super helpful. Um, uh, that was really cool to see all of those um, um, funding opportunities lined up. I'm sure that's going to really help with uh, planning um, across uh, across the Southeast with communities. Um, so next slide. Um, and then the other thing that we're really working on is a uh, EVSE how-to uh, playbook in February. Um, this is something that will be somewhat interactive. There'll be uh, videos associated with it. It's really um, like a, a, a step up from the toolkits. It's it's um, it's uh, going to be just a little bit more interactive. We're thinking of, of various modules here, the role of local government, funding for EVSE infrastructure, identifying community partners, planning, permitting, and zoning, contracting, setting fee structure, and um, peer showcase. Uh, so, so each of these things will uh, be a how-to um, with course material um, that's going to be based on um, information that uh, the DOE uh, uh, Clean Energy to Communities um, program has already um, uh, uh, put together, but in an, an interactive interactive way. Uh, and then next slide. This is just a, a small plug for clean energy to communities. It's a DOE technical assistance program that's already available for communities. There's three elements of it. One is in-depth partnership. Um, one is a peer learning cohort. And then uh, the other piece is expert match. Um, I just wanted a flag for everyone on the call that um, there'll be an upcoming peer learning cohort that's focused on EV uh, development and communities. Um, and that uh, you can go to this website here and um, sign up for that um, to be notified when that opportunity comes available. So what will happen is you can apply for that. It's a, a free program, of course. Um, and if your community is selected, you'll be put in with a cohort that um, goes through developing uh, aspects of a project together. The other thing, if you're not aware of, is that um, C2C, as they call it, uh, offers this expert match piece um, that's 40 to 60 hours of technical assistance um, uh, from, from uh, a subject matter expert. You can ask a variety of, of questions. It's, it's really uh, focused on anything that you'd like it to be. Um, it could be uh, community engagement. It could be um, how do I work with my utility. It could be something very specific about like how do I plan my station to integrate with storage. Um, so uh, this this program uh, is is open, um, and you you could ap apply for that. And then um, uh, next slide, Dory. 
Um, then, then, oh, well, uh, just back one. Thanks. Um, and then, so in FY24, these are the uh, two main pieces that we're really trying to develop focused on community-based projects, not just CFI, but uh, community-based projects. One is uh, a concierge service. Um, it'll be very similar to what we've developed with uh, Nevi um, and the school bus funding projects that um, Stephen referenced earlier, but but a place where you could send an email and uh, get an answer to your technical question. Um, we're hoping with with that, uh, if it, it is a little bit more in depth, what we'll be able to do is point you to um, a, something that's similar to the expert match that I already described. Um, it'll be one on one advice from a subject matter expert who can help you on um, trickier aspects of, of the project. So two things we're working on for FY24. Um, that we're hoping uh, will be helpful uh, for communities that are developing projects. And then um, finally, um, my last slide here is just a, a reminder that um, so the joint office has had 30 plus webinars. We're still we're still doing webinars. You can uh, go to driveelectric.gov slash webinars and um, see all the webinars we've hosted to date, but that there's one coming up on the 5th. Um, uh, that's riot electric as opposed to drive electric. Um, uh, the importance of multimodal transportation. So um, all of all of these resources exist on our website and um, are available to you at any time. So um, that's that's our last slide, and we're happy to take any questions. Great. Well, thank you, Julie and Stephen, for for your presentations. Um, and so folks are are welcome to. Um, raise their hand if they have a question, or if you prefer to type your question in the Q&A, you can do that as well. We do have one that came in through the Q&A from uh, J.R. Sadell in Atlanta. Um, so if you could uh, unmute John so he can ask the question about uh, making sure stations are showing up on alt fuel locator for um, replacement. Yeah, you got it, Stan. Uh, well, thanks for the presentation uh, for both of y'all. Um, so this is a slide that was earlier in terms of uh, federal funding opportunities. Uh, the $100 million reliability and accessibility uh, grant, uh, explained to my department, it's just the maintenance grant. That My question is, um, when we got the original list of, uh, right in, in Georgia, it was right around 200, Atlanta, fewer. Um, none of our publicly accessible stations were listed um that were both um temporarily uh unavailable or just not working anymore because the and they're over five years old uh, and these are networked and non-network stations and so um we submitted using the uh, the alternate fuel station locator submission tool um the submitted a new station uh, because they they weren't even showing up on the map in the first place um to try and, you know, it was three three or four weeks before the final list came out uh, for eligibility. And we didn't, uh, one, the none of the stations around 20 that we submitted were um, registered. Uh, and then two, they didn't, uh, they still haven't shown up on the uh, alternate fuel station locator, uh, even just as, you know, publicly accessible stations. So I think that that was, um, you know, a little frustrating because it was a missed opportunity, but then we also spent a lot of time on just, you know, trying to get it on this map. Um, so I guess my, I, I guess there's two questions. First question is, um, you know, what can we do to make sure that it shows up on this map? And then two, uh, you know, to make it eligible in the future uh, for temporarily uh, unavailable uh, stations, um, even though that, that, uh, that timeline has passed, um, maybe in the future. Uh, what 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 can we do? And what process can we follow to make sure that those locate those stations are on the map and are registered as you know available, working, or temporarily not available? Um, so those are my two questions. Okay, great. thanks, Jr. Stephen, you want to go ahead and take that? Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, and I, and I I'm sorry that that you had you know that that you guys ran into that issue, um, that unfortunate situation. Uh, you know, so I don't I I don't directly support um, the EV cross, so I I I can't say 
what may have happened um, in your particular case. I know um, there was a pretty, you know, this was another program that was kind of shot shot out, um, quick turnaround, not a lot of notice. Um, in fact, I think it broke the day that we were all sitting um, together in Savannah. So there was uh, a process that was very, again, very quick turnaround. I think there was like a four week window where if the stations weren't listed on the AFD, on the Alternative Fuel Data Center, um, there was a, I guess there was a, a an, an API, um, an application programming interface or an API tool on the AFDC that um, that's where there was a four week window to basically submit that information. Is that, did you, did you guys? Um, uh, yeah, and the, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, we, we use that, you know, um, that, that, the, the submit a new station API. Yeah. Uh, By October 11th. Oh yeah. Before that. Okay. All right. Cause I know that they weren't accepting manual, um, you know, man, basically uh, manual uh, updates being sent in. They, they weren't going to be able to process those. Uh, and then did you follow up with the, with the website, the DOT, or I'm sorry, the email address for the program to inquire about this? I'm just, I'm just curious. I hadn't heard this before. Um, yeah. We did through our uh, partners at the Electrification Coalition, um, and you know that that that's the the guidance that they got is exactly what you were saying, and so that's why we filled it out, and that's why I'm a little surprised that it's still not on the map because I get it; it's a quick turnaround. Um, yeah, but it, it's also just it was an excuse for me to make sure to to go get all of our departments to uh, submit all of their stations that um that are public facing and publicly accessible just so that it's on this map um you know and that was gonna be a benefit whether or not we got any grant funding but um but that, that's something that i think we could follow up with i know that there's probably others in this group yeah that... we, we there, there's some you know julie and i um we're gonna follow up with the national renewable energy lab they're the ones that um you know, they, they had the piece of, you know, they manage, they oversee the AFDC, the maps um, and that database. And, uh, you know, we want to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. And I'm not sure if this was isolated or others had this. Um, so, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on um, your name and, and kind of what, what went on here. Um, and, and again, sorry that you had to endure that hardship, it sounds like it was still a worthy exercise, but not not what you wanted to have. <laughs> Certainly not what yeah. you wanted. Yeah. I, I still think that there's an opportunity to at least have our stations that are on the map. Right. And, yeah. and surprise uh, future funding opportunities or anything's reissued in the future. I don't um that I think that that yeah, that would be positive. Yeah. Okay. Well, and there may, and, and if there was a reason, particular reason why they were kicked out, um, we're not accepted. Obviously, we won't. We want to find that out. So yeah, sounds well, good. Thanks. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for raising that that challenge, John. That's that that's great, and we'll um, you know, we'll we'll work with with Stephen and Julie to make sure that we get out to the to the collaborative whatever they they learn from the from the renewable lab on that question. We also had a question come in from Jennifer Westerholm um, about when the community fueling infrastructure grants are hopefully going to be announced. And, and Julie did confirm in the Q&A that we hope that we'll have an announcement by the end of the year. So we'll keep our, our fingers crossed on that. That'll be an exciting uh, end of year gift if that's able to happen. Um, are there any other uh, questions that folks have for, for Stephen or Julie at this time? It looks like Sarah Miller just asked one. So if you could unmute her, please. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi, Sarah. We can hear you. Maybe speak up a little bit louder. Okay. Um, I just submitted in the chat and I I don't I kind of came in after the facts, and I don't know if um with the previous question was referring to was the EV charge reliability and accessibility accelerator grant, if that is the case. Uh, I just had a question regarding that grant specifically. So when that grant kind of came out really fast, um, we just recently fixed uh, a few of our stations. We're a really small team, so we just didn't feel that it was made sense for us to apply for it, though, you know, it sounds like it may happen again, um, if that is true. Can we do like a 
reimbursement? Like, could I submit for the stations that were refixed re and replaced, for example? Um, if that does happen, like, what is that process? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, you know, generally uh, the way federal highway funding has worked um, with the other programs, and I think as a rule, they don't do retroactive reimbursement. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I mean, that question has come up for some of the other programs too. Uh, you know, the, the, this has to be, typically the, the work needs to be done um, post-award as opposed to pre-award. Okay. Um, yeah, so. I Is mean, it going to happen again? Are you I will gonna... ask again, that's for sure. Well, is it going to happen again? Like, will that grant come out? Oh, that? as far as um, yeah, th this so this is this money um, the ten percent of that five billion for for the Nevi program was set aside, and uh, really for Federal Highway to kind of come up with you know how it wanted to best you know, you know uh, obligate or 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 disperse see the, the funds get issued or dispersed. So um, I I have a feeling that they're gonna you know there were seven thousand locations that were. Um, that did make it onto the AFDC is, is eligible for repair or replacement under this program. And I, I don't believe they got, you know, not all of those, those locations were, um, you know, were addressed. And it sounds like obviously from, from John's situation, there's, there's a lot of other charges that weren't captured um, in the quick turnaround. So I, my sense is that they will offer this again, um, but you know, they, they, this can turn into something else as well. So, um, but yeah, yeah well, ours break probably like every few months. Like we have, I'm in the city of Winter Park, and we have a high influx of EV charging um, that's happening in our city. So our units break every few months on um, different things, um, software yeah. issues versus clips versus the whole unit. It really just depends. So, I mean, if it comes up again, we'll definitely sit and wait to get them fixed. Um, but it really is a time thing, I guess, for us because we can't just wait, unfortunately, for our city because people are very much pressing us to get them fixed. So, yeah. yeah. And the, well, you know, I'm, I don't know, uh, Julie, if you have any other thoughts, but my sense from everything I understand from the team that's working on this at Federal Highway, you know, this is supposed to be, you know, they, they're trying to get, obviously the application window was probably a little too quick, um, or at least the, the heads up that this was coming was very quick, but, um, you know, they're trying to get the awards done quick and then it's only a 12 month performance period. So. Um, my guess is that they'll, you know, they're going to do this again. There'll be ample heads up, um, but we will express that, you know, you all need that, especially to make sure that um, the charges that, that you want to apply for are in the system and um, certified eligible to go. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. And we've got another question that's come in um, that we have time for here. And it's from uh, Rick Longabart. So if we could unmute Rick, that's good. Thank you, Stan. This is, this is Rick Lumber. Can you hear me okay? Go for it, Rick. I, I was just curious, has there been any examples of collaborative grants or whatever, whatever funding mechanism that you've discussed that has prevailed where there's two agencies nearby that have jointly submitted grants? If you can, if you can elaborate a little bit on some examples that may have been successful maybe not and does that merit maybe a higher reward when two agencies are joining together opposed to one and i think that's just an open-ended question yeah um well so in terms of cfi you know the first round hasn't been announced yet so we're not sure exactly which awards you know were successful but just in general, um, yeah, certainly joint joint applications, um, you know, are, are eligible, and there can be a lot of strength in that. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would encourage it uh, to the extent that it makes sense. I mean, there can be, uh, you know, I know, you know, uh, you know, not being able to get into too many details. I mean, no, there there were applications, you know, on the CFI side that were small as a small one, a single municipality to statewide, you know, statewide application with, you know, a whole host of municipalities included as partners. So it kind of ran the gamut and, um, you know, depending, sometimes, sometimes they have a critical, you know, to have, um, you know, a good plan with good partners together can make for a strong application. No, thank, thank you for that. And just to add on to the previous conversation, one of the challenges with repairing disabled chargers is is the 
window of receiving them. Uh, a lot of a lot of companies, um, I won't name names, but there's the windows of anywhere between four to six months of delivery. So if your window is one hour of replacement, uh, and you're assuming that that charger is disabled for whatever reason, whether it's software, technology, or hardware, uh, just to get the charger could take six months, let alone repairing it. So I mean that that window is really tight. Yeah, I think that's going to be that's going to be an issue for for a lot of these programs getting the equipment and the supply, you know, making sure the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned. There were a lot of lessons learned standing up these programs um, in in kind of getting the opportunities out and then getting the applications in and making the awards. And then the next the next you know set of lessons learned is going to be on the deployment and implementation. So, but yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, four to six months. Not. Not ideal. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Appreciate appreciate those questions, and 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 Stephen and Julie really appreciate you being here and um, that connectivity between these participating local governments and and the federal agencies that you all represent is is really great. So thank you for taking these questions back, helping to get some answers, and continuing to make these programs better for for local governments to access and implement. Really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and shift uh, gears now and still talk about awesome federal programs that can really help drive transportation electrification. Um, and we're going to shift to speaking with Samantha Jacoby, who's with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, to talk a little bit about the tax credits um, that are going to be helping to support local governments uh, with infrastructure and vehicles. So, Samantha, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. And, uh, yeah. and let me just say, sorry, that that similar to how we operated with Stephen and Julie, when Samantha's done with their presentation, we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. So again, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A uh, chat or else uh, just raise your hand when we get there. So thank you. Go ahead, Samantha. Uh, great. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. I already learned a ton from Stephen and Julie. Uh, so it, um, it's nice to be here. Uh, uh, my name is Samantha Jacoby. I work um, for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Um, for those of you who don't know our organization, um, we are a nonpartisan uh, research and policy institute in D.C. Uh, we seek to advance federal and state policies that uh, reduce poverty and inequality. Um, so our climate work reflects that lens, right? We, there's a huge potential for the IRA um, to, to create opportunities for low-income and historically marginalized communities. Um, that's going to require resources and, and education to, to make sure those communities benefit. So um, I work on federal tax. Um, so my focus here is on um, the, the tax credits in the IRA. Uh, and, and so that's sort of just sort of where I'm, I'm coming from in this. Um, so in the next slide, uh, I'm just, just, you know, quick formal uh, disclaimer, I'm a lawyer, but this is not legal advice. Um, I, I, we're not legal services providers um, here. So um, I will include a slide later on that has some links to more uh, detailed uh, resources, including some uh, legal um, information. Uh, so the next slide, um, just gonna quickly go through what I plan to talk about today. Um, I'm gonna give some background on um, two of the tax credits in the IRA um, to promote electric vehicles um, and charging infrastructure, um, as well as uh, direct pay or elective pay, um, if we're being official, but um, I'm gonna refer to it as direct pay um, and how these, these credits are um, gonna be really important to public entities. Um, I'm also gonna talk uh, in a bit more detail about the Treasury Department's proposed guidance on direct pay. Um, so next slide, um, just to kind of level set on the importance of the IRA credits for, for local governments specifically, um, the Menino survey of mayors found that mayors clearly recognize that they're going to have to transition their fleets to green vehicles and soon, um, that's across the board, mayors of both parties, this is the, the most highly supported policy intervention in the climate space. Um, but doing that is going to require tremendous upfront financing. 
Um, so that's really where the, the IRA tax credits come in. 70% uh, of the IRA's $400 billion in climate investments are for tax credits. Um, but what, what I've seen, what my colleagues have seen um, when talking to state and local government stakeholders and partner organizations is that you know, almost no one even knows what direct pay is, let alone how to claim it. Um, lots of, uh, of, of these folks are, are more focused on grant programs that have sort of clear deadlines and that are more familiar to them. That makes sense. Um, but, uh, you know, the tax credits combined with direct pay are really powerful financial tools. So we want to just, um, in increase our, 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 education levels there. Um, so, uh, on the next slide, I'm just going to first give some background on the IRA's tax credits for electric vehicles. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about direct pay and how they, uh, direct pay can help local governments access those credits. So starting with the, the Qualified Commercial Clean Vehicle Credit, um, this is not solely for electric vehicles, but for this purpose, um, I'm going to just talk about electric vehicles. Um, so the, the, the credit um, can cover up to 30% of a vehicle's cost for, um, for commercial, uh, commercial fleets, um, up to $40,000 per vehicle for large vehicles, over 14,000 pounds. Um, or uh, up to a max of $7,500 per vehicle for smaller vehicles. Um, the vehicles uh, to qualify for the credit must be from an approved manufacturer. And there's, there's an IRS list of qualified um, manufacturers. And it's a pretty long list, but it's important to just double check it. Um, another thing to note for, for this credit, um, unlike some of the other IRA credits, there is no domestic assembly or content requirement. So that's just uh, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then on the next slide, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the credit for charging infrastructure. Um, so again, this is a 30% credit um, up to $100,000. Um, but to qualify for this one, uh, the charging and infrastructure has to be located in a non-urban area or a low-income census tract. And uh, I'll talk in a, in a little bit about what that means. But um, the other thing um, here, the, the full 30% credit is only available if um, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements are met. And if not, the credit is, uh, is worth 6%. So you do get a, a haircut if you don't meet those requirements. Um, so the next slide, I'm going to um, just explain some, some of the definitions there. Um, so again, you have to be, uh, the, 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 the property has to be in a non-urban area or qualifying low in, in income census tract. For this credit, the non-urban area is just uh, the census designates uh, census tracts as urban or non-urban, so it's just purely what the census has defined it as. Um, the qualifying low-income census tract is defined in um, the in the IRA as a census tract that's it's a it's a relatively high poverty census tract, poverty rates at least twenty percent, or uh, a relatively low median family income in that census tract to 80% of the area median income. Um, so, you know, th there's definitions there, but sort of how do you find out what's a what's a low income census tract? Um, there are a couple of mapping tools out there. Um, uh, I, I've used one um, from uh, an organization called ESRI. They, they provide mapping tools. Um, and so on the next slide, I just, I'm just including a quick screenshot here. Um, I, I'm from Houston, so I, I put in um, a census tract in Houston. It's it's pretty easy to use. You can just like put in your address, and it tells you it shows your census tract and whether it qualifies or not. Um, I'll just note that's you know it's not a guarantee that a census tract is qualifying just because it shows up on this map, um, but it's a good place to to start if you're looking to develop some some charging infrastructure. Um, yeah. So the next slide, I'm just gonna go through a quick example to help crystallize and kind of envision what's possible here. Um, so say a city has um, a fleet of existing internal combustion engine vehicles and um, they they uh, they they have, want to update the fleet with electric vehicles and put in some charging infrastructure. Um, to do that costs uh, $900,000 um, that um, with the, the federal credits, 
um, the federal government will kick in one hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars, assuming they you know they meet all the qualification requirements. Um, so you know that's a, that's a, a pretty significant share of the overall project costs, and what that that does right is it enables the the city to have faster cost recovery for their investment and um, overall faster fleet transition. And that's right on top of just the environmental benefits of having gre greener vehicles on the road, um, right? But the so that's how the credits work. But the, the way that local governments can access these tax credits, right? Because they're they're tax credits. Local governments don't typically pay taxes, so you might think like, okay, well, what use is that to us? But um, the way that local governments can access the credits is through direct pay, and and I think that's really best thought of as as a as a financing mechanism it's it's a tool for local governments to use the tax credits and receive cash refunds um and in in it, it, unlike unlike a grant right it's uncapped there's no competitive application process um you do have to sort of go through steps with the the IRS to to get it but um it, it, you know there it's 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 different than a than a, um than most grant programs in that way um so I'm gonna move to the next slide. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more background on um, on sort of the qualification um, for direct pay, right? Uh, the, the Treasury Department this past summer issued uh, proposed guidance um, implementing direct pay because they were, they were coming out of the uh, the law, there were still tons of questions about how it would be implemented, what exactly it, it meant, how to apply, that kind of thing. Um, so the proposed guidance came out. Um, you know, it's it's I'd say, um, you know, there's a I said there are proposed rules, and it's not totally clear when final regulations are going to be issued. But um, Treasury has said that entities can rely on proposed regulations while final regulations are outstanding. So that just that means you know you can sort of use what's in the proposed regs to 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 go through the direct pay process for the time being, um, and you know just some of the the most important topics that um, that that were in the proposed rules. Um, first here, I've, who's eligible? Um, the statute itself wasn't a hundred percent clear about which public entities could qualify for direct pay. Um, there are questions about whether state instrumentalities like public hospitals and universities could qualify, for example, um, and territories. Um, in general, the proposed rules take um, a very broad view of who's eligible. So those um, state and local uh, government instrumentalities do qualify, territory governments do qualify, agencies, public power. So um, that's all very good. Um, the next slide, I'm gonna go through a couple more issues that were in the proposed rules. Um, so payments are made as lump sum payments at the end of the whole process, right? So you, you go through, you install your, your project, you, you file a tax return, and then you get the payment. Um, people were sort of hoping that there's maybe going to be some kind of advanced payment option, but that's not the case. It's, it's all kind of after, after the fact. Um, and that means, right, that, that bridge financing is going to be really important because of that time lag. Um, you know, if the project is put in service in January, they can't get the direct payment for, you know, over a year. Um, and that's going to be, you know, important kind of for lots of local governments and especially for um, governments with you know, fewer resources and in low income or marginalized areas. Um, another issue is, is this issue of stacking multiple credits um, on or stacking credits on top of other incentives like grants or forgivable loans. Um, Treasury was clear that uh, credits can stack with other grants or forgivable loans up to 100% of the project costs. So um, you can't get more than 100%, but you can get up to 100%. Um, another issue is about um, partnerships. So let's just say, for example, two cities that are right next to each other wanted to um, install charging infrastructure uh, that they jointly own, they might otherwise want to do that like through a legal partnership entity and, and in each own like 50% of it. Um, they can't do it through a legal entity. They can jointly own property, but they have to directly own the property. Um, 
and that just creates kind of a structuring concern that you want to be aware of um, and, and it can, can be kind of complicated. So you may, you know, if something like that came up, you'd probably want to um, consult like a tax advisor. Um, another issue, right, you just really want to make sure you hit deadlines. Um, there's no relief for, for late filing. Um, you can't amend returns if you uh, kind of leave something out. So um, at least that's what's in the proposed rules. Um, we'll see how, how it kind of plays out in the final rules, but um, direct ownership is required of projects. So you uh, that means like, so there's separately from direct pay, taxable entities um, can sort of transfer their credits to other buyers if they can't use them. Um, but but what, what the rules say is, is like government entities can't buy credits on that transfer market and then claim direct pay. They have to own the, the projects that they're claiming direct pay for. Um, so yeah, these are important issues that got a lot of attention during the comment period. And so that's something that I'm going to be looking closely at when the final rules can come out to see if there are any changes there. Um, so next slide on um, process for claiming direct pay. Of course, you have to sort of identify and pursue the project that you want to claim a tax credit for. That's the first step, uh, all the planning that goes along with that. Um, and then there's two steps that you have to take with the IRS. The first one is a pre-filing registration process, and that's going to be done on an e-portal that's, um, I, I believe, not yet available for public use, um, but uh, it may come out, I think it's supposed to come out by the end of the year. Um, that you have to do that pre-registration process for each property you want to claim a credit for. Um, and there's a bunch of information that the IRS is going to require. Um, and then uh, you, at the end of that process, you get a registration number. And that registration number is really important. It has to be on every tax return that you file um, for direct pay. The next step, of course, is to file a tax return. Um, and the due date for a tax return is generally four and a half months after um, after the end of your tax year. A tax year is sort of just a, a, an accounting concept um, that that uh, you'll have to figure out what your tax year is, and it, it can be um, there are rules about how to determine your tax year. But um, for for example, um, a, a city that doesn't typically file tax returns but it runs on a, a calendar year, fiscal year, um, that that would mean that their tax return, their that, sorry, that if you're in a calendar year, fiscal year, generally you're going to have a calendar year tax year and the tax return would be due four and a half months after the end of that year, the calendar year. Um, so that's a really important thing just to, to, to hammer out. Um, the, the last thing on process, uh, the time I mentioned this before, but the direct pay payments will be um, paid out after um, the tax return is filed and the return is processed. Um, so then um, lastly, just a, a few things that are going to be needed to do the pre-registration. This is just what the IRS has said is needed. There is, uh, I have a bullet here for other IRS required information. So it's not clear exactly what they're going to require, but they know, but they have said they're at least going to require these things. So um, some uh, identifying information about the taxpayer and the project um, and the, the tax year and type of tax return. So um, there's, yeah, so I think the important thing to take away, right, is there's, there's two steps. The first step is pre-registration, um, and you have to do that with enough time in advance of the filing of the tax return so that you get that registration number. Cause without that registration number, you can't do the tax return. Um, yeah, and I'm sure there's <laughs> there's lots of uh, process related questions. I, I put my email in the um, in the first slide. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions by email. Um, and uh, you may get a more thoughtful response from me by email than, than um, than live anyway. So um, I, the last slide I have here is just, um, or no, I did, I, I forgot about this timeline slide. Yeah, so this is um, just kind of a sample simplified timeline um, that, you know, if, if a city bought um, some EVs and installed chargers in 2023, how they, you know, then kind of structure their, their the, the next steps in the process. They do the pre-registration portal before the tax return um, and they have to do that for each um, 
each project and and um and each credit they're going to receive um as well as uh filing their tax return we're assuming here their calendar year taxpayer so they would have a may 15th tax return deadline and um, they can get a six-month extension um, if they so choose and then at some point after the return is processed they'll get their direct payment um yeah so i think my my hopefully actually last slide is the resource slide um where I've just um, included some things that I found to be very helpful. Uh, I think the IRS website is kind of notoriously hard to use. There's a ton of information. It might be hard to find what the right thing is. Um, but the the we'll link here, the direct pay FAQs, I found to be very helpful. And they, there are lots of links there. Um, if you're so inclined, the actual proposed rules, um, the tax return that uh, most, um, most government entities will probably use, um, the MAP, for low income census tracts that I uh, I included a screenshot from earlier, and then lawyers for good government. If if folks aren't um, uh, kind of familiar with them, they're they're really good like direct legal services nonprofit organization um, that's been really active in this space. They have lots of um, resources, webinars, um, Q and A, and I, I believe they're going to be doing some direct technical support um, as well. So really really good resources there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that leaves a decent amount of time for for some questions. Well, thank you, Samantha. I really appreciate you uh, diving into this very complicated topic of of tax credits. So thanks for being here. We do have a few questions, so I'll go ahead and and cut through them. I think first, uh, Gordon Kenna, I see your comment about Georgia passing legislation to tax EV charging. So so thanks for reminding us about that. Um, those of us who work in Georgia will be working with legislators to try to make that final, um, you know, uh, tax law work as good as it can for uh, for EV charging and local government entities in particular. So happy to connect with you, Gordon, on that afterwards. Um, Rick, why don't, if you could, uh, Kyle, take, take Rick Longobart off of mute again so he can ask his question about ARPA funds. Yeah, thank you, Stan. And, and this... This um, is more like, a, I guess, a double dipping question, Samantha. If, if we were to re replace or install EV chargers throughout the city using ARPA funds, which are federal fund dollars, are we still eligible for tax credits if we use ARPA funds to buy the infrastructure and then, or the vehicles for that matter, um, and then try to receive tax credits? Or is that an, an ineligible? Yeah, I and haven't that, um, thought about the the ARPA money for state specifically, um, right? Like, there's the 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 interesting. Okay, so yeah, I mean the grants, right? You can't stack above a hundred percent. But this is different from a grant. Um, so if I use, so for example, let me just maybe explain in a scenario, right? We have bought many electric vehicles using ARPA funds in the city. So if I buy, let's just say 10 electric vehicles through a dealership, then can I get those tax credits, say the 7,500 for less than 1,400 GBW and apply those to the vehicles if I use ARPA funds to buy the vehicles opposed to say general fund money? Right. And, and that may, there may not be an answer to that right now, but I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, I haven't encountered that exact scenario. So let me um let me think about it. And, and can I follow up with you offline? I can um, absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't. I just don't want to answer the question and and, yeah. and incorrectly. And it, it's it's a tricky question, and I have to imagine that I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Uh, so therefore, others must be thinking about the same scenario, right? Because there's yeah, yeah kinds of alternative fund money uh, for incremental dollars in which they didn't plan for you know years ago. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, thanks for that one, Rick. And we'll certainly, yeah, Samantha, whatever you determine there, um, you know, let us know and we can share it out to the group as well. So let me go ahead and move on to uh, Robin Richardson. Um, if you could go ahead and unmute Robin so she can ask her question. Yeah, hi. Um, so just a follow-up question on um, when the filing would be due. Um, so like, you know, I know that for a calendar year tax full year that the deadline would be um, 
the May date, but um, I know for our um, government structure, our fiscal year is um, July 1st through um, June 30th. Mm -hmm. um, so then would the deadline for filing be, um, you know, if that's the same as our taxable year, um, would then our um, filing deadline be like sometime in November, I think is what the math works out to there. Yeah, so that's that's right. There's um, the 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 rule for for entities that don't typically file tax returns or haven't filed a tax return is that you would use the tax year that corresponds with your established accounting period. So for local governments, right, that would be your fiscal year, um, and then yeah, four and a half months from that the end of that year. Um, I think there is some question or concern that that like can, or can 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 governments choose a different tax year if they want to. Um, I don't know that there's like a solid answer on on that. But so for now, I think the the under the like sort of existing guidance, um, what's out there, the, the the sort of safe answer right is to use your your established fiscal year as your tax year, and then and then four and a half months from that. Plus, right, I mentioned you can get an automatic six-month extension of that deadline. Um, but uh, there's there's sort of advantages and disadvantages of using that extension. It means it takes longer to get your direct payment, but gives you more time to file. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, if you could unmute Heather Bullock, please, so she can ask her qualified census track question. Hi, good afternoon, thank you. I just was curious, um, again, I, I um, missed the exact percentage that you said um, for low income communities to qualify for, um, for the IRA, I think. And I was just wondering, I'd found um, while I was searching quickly online, the qualified census tracts. I didn't know if you knew if that's, if that met the mark or if it was, um, you know, or what the percentage was. Cause I went and looked on the ArcGIS platform as well. And it says like, it has them highlighted, but then it says like population below poverty level, you know, a certain percentage. So I was just curious um, what the requirement was, if you knew. Yeah, there. So for for you know, there's two ways to qualify um, for the charging credit. Either you have to be a non-urban census tract or low income census tract. And the low income census tract, there's two ways within that one to qualify. You have to it, the census tract has to have um, poverty rates of uh, above 20 20 percent or the median family income in that census tract has to be um, 80 percent or less of sort of the area median so that's that's where they're kind of pulling from in that um, uh, that map um, so yeah that's that's just that's just designated in the in the statute um, there's not really kind of any way around that so there has to be, just to clarify, there has to be 20% below poverty level. Is that right? There has to, the poverty rate in the census tract is 20%. So 20% poverty rate or the median family income is 80% or less of the area median. So like say you're in a city and the median income is $100,000, the census tract has a median family income of $75,000. That's that's less than 80% of the, the metropolitan area fam, median family income. So that's why that one would qualify. Gotcha, um, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, they like to have, you know, multi-tiered definitions that are extra complicated. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Heather. We have a couple of other questions. Let me just check in. Dory, do you want to jump over to the Mentimeter or do you want us to answer a few more of these questions while we're here? Yeah, I think we've got some time. <clears throat> okay. 
Then let me, I'm going to go ahead and add, we, we've got a couple that came in as anonymous attendees. So apologies if this is your question, but as an anonymous, I don't think we can unmute you. <laughs> but uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask the question on your behalf. Um, Samantha, the question is about the guidance uh, and Justice 40 designated census tracts. So I know Heather's question was what it was, and, and this one's asking if it's uh, possible to request direct pay for chargers that are installed outside of Justice 40 tracks, or is Justice 40 a requirement? Yeah, I don't I don't think that there's sort of like an exemption process. I think it is just what's in the in the statute. Um, so sorry. OK, great. Thank you. And then we've got Kevin Lindley has a question. So if we could unmute Kevin. Hello. Yeah, I was just wondering about the um, the wage and apprenticeship requirements. Um, I, I'm not sure how we would be able to determine that. Is there a, a like, do the contractors have to file some form that talks about their apprenticeship or, or how would we determine if it met that requirement? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think this is probably one of the areas that are as is um, going to be the hardest um, for for um, local governments kind of early on, right? I think over time, it's going to become much more standardized. Contractors are going to be familiar, more familiar with what they'll have to do. But right now, it's sort of a lot of questions about, like, do I qualify? Does my contractor qualify? Um, so I think one thing to do as you're, uh, as you're sort of issuing um, solicitations or working on contracts is is just um, make sure that's very clear that that these will have to qualify and, and so that contractors know what their requirements are. Um, there is guidance um, from from Treasury. I think it's a, a notice um, that it, it, it basically the wage requirements um, are, are sort of just on the Department of Labor's sort of standard wage um, websites. Um, so that one may be slightly easier to satisfy, but then the apprenticeship ones um, may be a little more complicated. So I, I think um, in the, in the first instance, right, like the first few kind of projects uh, may be important to just get, if you can, like legal advisors involved. Um, it, it may be worth uh, checking out the, the lawyers for good government resource page that I sent. They may have some good information there. Okay. Yeah, that was kind of my take on it. That the wage part would be pretty simple. You could probably just have the contractor fill that out, but I don't know if they even understand what what the apprenticeship requirements would be or or how I don't know how formalized their apprenticeship programs are if they would meet the requirements of the law. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Kevin, for raising that that issue. There's a, a final question also from anonymous attendee. So I'll ask it on behalf, Samantha. And it's asking about um, the length of time uh, to receive pre-registration. Is there an estimate about how long that would take? They're asking specifically if their tax filings next month, am I already too late? You know, basically get that uh get that pre-approval. Yeah, so I think um, it's not clear. Sorry for another sort of it's not clear answer, but um, it doesn't the the all the guidance that's out there so far doesn't say you know if you file your pre registration portal by you know X date you'll get an answer ten days later, right? It doesn't. There's it just says make sure you do it with enough lead time so that you'll have time to file your tax return, and that's kind of as detailed as they get. Um, I would say for your specific question on tax filing, um, I don't know that I would say you're too late because um, they haven't even put up the portal yet. So my guess is that there's like going to be some process. Um, I, I don't I, I, I can't like guarantee that. But um, the other thing is, right, you have an automatic or an option to file a six month tax return extension. Um, so uh, if the if the deadline is next month, then um, then you, you could you could likely get another six months added to that. 
Great. Well, really appreciate it, Samantha. We went through the questions that folks had put in and uh, yeah, look forward to your follow up with some information that we'll share out to everybody. And thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. And Dory, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you. So what we have next on the agenda is going through a few more Mentimeter questions so that we can um, kind of gauge where the communities are and then also to engage, uh, I'm sorry, to gauge what interest there is for the February um, virtual collaborative meeting. So um, if you guys remember how to do Mentimeter, um, you can either pull up your smartphone, the camera on it, and just scan the QR code, or you can go to Mentimeter and type in the code that's at the top of the screen, the 26837380. So what we are wondering with this first question is, um, since federal funding has begun to flow, how is your municipality prioritizing electric transportation, community engagement, and planning work? So I will let you guys go there and we can see the answer starting to pop up. So thank you guys. And yay, it's working technology, hooray. <laughs> Some of you guys may not have your phones right next to your computer. Probably should have put in the reminder for the call that we would be doing this. We still see some coming in, so give it just another minute or so. And while we're going through this question, if, if folks are still trying to um, to answer, I also wanted to make sure that um, Meg had made a comment in the um, webinar chat. So I wanted to make sure everybody saw that, that SSDN is partnering with Lawyers for Good Government on the IRA direct pay assistance. Um, so we will be getting that information out to all of you as well on how to request assistance from them. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip us over to the next question. And that is, how would you describe your progress in securing um, federal electric transportation funding? Are you guys in the planning phase? Are you actively drawing down funding or is anybody implementing federally funded ET projects already? Thanks for that shout out, Dory. Appreciate it. Yep. I feel like we need some Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> So it looks like most of everybody is in the planning phase, just got a couple that are actively drawing down. All right. 
Looks like we've slowed down on the responses, so I'll go ahead to the next question. Um, so as SACE and SSDN are exploring funding opportunities to continue the collaborative, we want to ensure that the collaborative, um, the format is delivering value for local government participants. So the question is, is the current large group format um, for either in-person or virtual convenings preferred? Or would you all like more tactical issue area focused small group convenings um, that would deliver more opportunities for learning? So basically, are you guys content with the large group or would you prefer small group? All right. Looks like large group is preferred minimally over the um, small group. For those that did say small group, um, this is an open-ended question. So what small groups would you have interest in? And it could be like getting started, how to start your electrification journey, or working with regional partners, looking at regional collaboration. Um, support on specific implementation questions, peer support on, which would be peer support on projects or planning efforts, uh, fleet manager cohort, whatever you guys are thinking. And I'm seeing in the um, question and answer, someone is an anonymous attendee. It says for the federal EV funds question, we have applied for multiple grants, but haven't heard back yet. And our partners for low, uh, for low no and EV bus have received and received wasn't an option past the planning. So thank you for letting us know about that. So I'm seeing some responses come in: business model for charger ownership, best practices working with regional collaboration, another for regional collaboration. Specific implementation questions, barely started, overwhelmed by too much info. Oh no, um, organized around experience level, current implementation. Another is pros and cons of different EV charger brands, uh, regional collaboration, how to get started, case study, and discussion of successful electrification initiatives for those of you that are on the phone and can't see the answers coming in. Um, another is best practices and implementing EV readiness policy, EV procurement, and updating EV fleet and community goals. So give that another minute just to make sure that everyone's had a chance to respond that wants to. Thank you for those responses. EV first procurement, community engagement, Staff training on EV ownership maintenance. Oh, that's my dog bear. He wanted to add his two cents. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move us on to our last question, which is for the upcoming meeting in February. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind selecting topics that you'd be most interested in, because we do want to make sure that the 
collaborative is being driven by what would benefit y'all most. So, um, so the choices are a workshop on how to create regional collaboration. The second is um, a workshop on how to write an RFP for an e-mobility plan. Um, the third choice is leveraging the private sector and deploying public charging stations. The fourth is federal funding compliance requirements. Um, the fifth is pitfalls to avoid in procuring EVs and charging infrastructure. And then the last is resources to help with grant writing and capacity needs. And if you are having trouble with the Mentimeter and really would like to, um, <laughs> you know, give your your two cents via email, please send me an email, and I would be happy to to make sure that that your voice gets counted in this. Um, John says he's interested in multiple of these potential February meeting subjects, so that's that's good. Can we only select one? Um, go ahead and select if you if you have like a top two. Go ahead and do that just so we can kind of see looks very much like pitfalls in procuring um, charging infrastructure is of interest to, to a lot of folks. Give that just another maybe 15 seconds. And then, like I said, if you're having trouble, then please just email me um, if you've got a topic that you're interested in and are not able to, to weigh in through the Mentimeter. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and switch us back over to the slides. There we go. So. Um, We're already thinking ahead to February. We did get some uh, feedback that folks do not like lunch meetings. So we made it a little bit earlier for the February call. Um, so please plan um, on holding your calendars for the next virtual event. It'll be Thursday, February 22nd from 10 to 11.30. We've already got the registration link right there. So you can um, click on it and register. Um, we'll, I'll also be sending out a email um, after the webinar today with the slides and the resources that were listed. So you guys can take a look at those. Um, and then I'll also have the register uh, for the February event link there. Um, please, if you've got neighboring communities that are interested in learning more about um, how to access federal funding, happy to be adding um, more local governments to the calls. We have had a tremendous amount of interest um, also from, from vendors and folks that were not local governments that we've had to say, sorry folks, it's just uh, for local governments because we wanna make sure that, um, that the space is protected and you guys feel um, comfortable working as a cohort of local governments. So, um, but if there are other you know, neighboring local governments that would like to join, please make sure that you, know, you pass along the registration link to them. Love to have additional members join on. Um, with that, um, any other comments from, from Meg or Stan? I'm really slow getting myself off mute and my video back on, but no, I don't have anything else to say, but thank you to our guests and thank you to all of our friends that joined us again. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Have a happy holidays, everybody. Thank you guys. Take care.